I'm going to move on now to introduce Santiago Rincon Gallardo, who I have the pleasure of sitting beside just now. Santiago is an educational innovator, I like that one, consultant and chief research officer in Microfoolin's team. He's involved in multiple projects in the US, Canada, Latin America and Europe. And through his research, he advises leaders and educators on transforming teaching and learning across entire education systems. His work focuses on education policy, educational inequity and social justice, all themes that we are wrestling with in Scotland. A key theme in Santiago's work is that for change to be effective in public education, it requires deep and widespread cultural change across all levels of a system. In a period of education reform, these are really important considerations for all of us working in Scottish education. So, without further ado, as I'm sure you're all as eager as me to hear from the wonderful Santiago, I shall pass the floor, or indeed the screen, over to you, Santiago. Welcome to SLF Conversations. Thank you so much, Jill. Thank you so much to everybody for joining this uh, Scottish Learning Festival um, conversations. I'm delighted to be here. This is my very first time in the UK, in person in the UK. Uh, and uh, I, have been I have had the opportunity this week to visit some schools, uh, to meet with colleagues at different levels of the system. And uh, one thing that I keep telling uh, the colleagues I've been meeting is how it feels like getting to see uh, old friends, getting to come to see old friends again. Um, and I, I, I'm hoping what I will be telling you about today, what I will be presented today, will, give, will make it clear why that is the case. Um, but let me, start, let me start with the following. I will, um, I will start my presentation uh, offering the dark side of things right now. I'll start with the dark part. And I promise I, will, I, I won't stay there too long. But I think it's an important thing to do, and I, I think it will become clear why. Uh, over the last several years, I, I made the conscious and almost also, also unconscious move to stop watching the news, uh, to, stop, to, to stop watching international reports about the state of the climate. And I decided to do that because it was very hard to see the degree and the depth and the extent of human suffering, of death of destruction that, that I was seeing all around us. So I decided to stop watching the news. Now recently I came to know Dr. Margaret Wheatley, a phenomenal author that I would recommend you to, 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 to get familiar with. Margaret Wheatley, Who Do We Choose To Be? is a fabulous book of hers. And she's become almost an instant mentor because uh, she helped me see the importance of looking, of paying attention of looking around, of seeing what's going on in the world around us, as painful, as difficult as it is. Because it is only when you look at where you are, where you face reality and see where you are, that you can make good decisions about what to do moving forward. And I was saying I will start with the dark part, because when you look, at, when you look around, when you pay attention, it's very clear that we're in a time of collapse. Uh, societal collapse, environmental collapse. This is not an opinion. It is a historically validated claim and a scientifically validated claim. When you look at what historians have been, especially those who study the rise and fall of civilizations across thousands of years all over the world, uh, now they're able to identify with tremendous accuracy what are some of the signs in a society that indicate that they are on the verge of collapse. And when you check that list against the moment where we are as a global society, as, 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 as humanity right now, it is very clear that uh, as a civilization we're reaching societal collapse. That, add to that environmental collapse. The, the, the reports of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change cannot be clearer. We are in the midst already of environmental collapse, of all the nine tipping points that the scientific community internationally has identified as the, as the points beyond which survival of humanity and, and life of the sustaining of life on the planet can, 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 
can be can be can be kept, you know, kept alive. Sustainability can 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 be sustained. The, the life in the planet can be sustained. Sorry, I, I will say it this way. Uh, of all those nine tipping points, we have already um, went past six of them, and we're very close to going past the seventh. Seven out of nine tipping points already reached. So even if we were to end carbon emissions right now across the world, there are, mechanism, there are uh, trends set up already in place that we cannot reverse. I said I was going to start with the dark part, and I said I was going to be short on that, and I'm about to finish. So we're in the midst of the collapse, and one possible way to respond to it is to withdraw, to lose hope, to drop the towel and to say there's nothing else to do. Um, and that's one option. And I think we're seeing many young people taking that option. Um, uh, many, many adults taking that option as well. Depression, anxiety, stress, violence, um, suicide attempts. That's one way. But there's another way, which is to look at whether there's something that's worth dedicating our lives to. And I think that one thing is the human spirit. I'm, um, I'm channeling here again Margaret Whitley. But she suggests that in times of collapse is when we have a great opportunity to come back to placing the human spirit at the center of what we do. She even, even more, she, uh, she invites us to see our role as leaders, as warriors of the human spirit, people who defend, protect, help keep alive the human spirit. And even more, she invites us to see our work as creating islands of sanity, spaces, organizations, systems, uh, institutions that protect this sacred flame that is the human spirit. And I believe that's absolutely worth our best efforts. It's actually in times of collapse where sometimes the best of humanity arises. Many of the saints that we, uh, that we now uh, know uh, arose in those times. So that's my invitation. It is time of collapse, and I think there's a lot to do to keep the human spirit alive. Now, in the, when, when you look at the, the, the ways in which human relationships are being, and human activity is being shaped up right now, we can see two very different trends, two very clear trends on the way, again, human activity is being organized. The first trend is a trend of further domination and control domination and control of some, um, the state of our citizens, of some groups over others, of um, uh, the, some nations over, the, over others, of humans over nature, etc. That's one very clear direction that we see uh, unfolding right now and strengthening right now. Further domination, further control. On the other hand, we see uh, in an opposite direction, another beautiful trend that we see emerging, which is the emergence of solidarity and freedom. And um, we are living in a time when, regardless of whether we want it or not, what we do, what we say, on an everyday interactions with those we lead, with the people we work, with our families, we contribute to one or the other, to one direction and then the other. And I think we need to start to become very explicit and very clear about which of these two directions do we want to contribute to. And I'm not here to convince you that one direction is better than the other, but I want to really encourage you and urge you to ask yourself this question, which of these two directions do I want to contribute to? I have my own personal preference, and I do think that solidarity of freedom is the way to go. And I believe that because I know that domination and control dehumanize. They, they dehumanize us. The, the path of solidarity and freedom and love and care, that's the path of humanity. Uh, and, and that's the extent of the, of the importance 
of asking ourselves this question, which direction are we going to be contributing to? And as we are at this crossroads of uh, where we don't know what's going to be the dominating trend, the dominant trend, I think as leaders and as educators, we need to ask ourselves a very fundamental question right now, which is, why educate? Why do we educate? And um, when I think about the education I want, to, uh, I want for my children and for children around the world, um, and also after reviewing what different um, civilizations and cultures uh, across history have uh, defined as what the purposes of education should be, I think it's easy to flesh them out and to, to identify core major purposes for education. Again, when I think about the education I want for my children and for children around the world, I think about an education that helps young children and young people, uh, children, young people, adults, to know themselves, to think and learn by themselves, to take care of themselves and others, and to better the world. And I think that's a good set. Again, I, I'm not here to convince you that that's, that's actually what the purpose of education should be, uh, uh, but I want to invite you to ask yourself this question and to answer it with as much clarity and specificity as possible. Why do we educate? But I suspect that your list won't be very different from the one I pre I'm presenting here. Now, I was saying that coming to Scotland felt like coming home, like coming to visit old friends. When I started to uh, review some of the reports, some of the tools, some of the materials that have been created in this beautiful country, I came across the Curriculum for Everyone, uh, for Excellence, sorry, the Curriculum for Excellence. And when I looked at the four capacities that uh, that Curriculum for Excellence is proposing, we cultivate our children, I saw a one -on one-on-one, one-to-one correspondence with these four uh, purposes that I'm talking about. Confident individuals are people who know themselves. Right? Successful learners are people who think and learn by themselves. Responsible citizens are essentially people who take care of themselves and others. And the effective contributors are people who better the world. So there was a one-on-one -on -one correspondence, and it felt, again, like, 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 like a beautiful uh, coincidence to see a nation that's putting its effort on the, uh, on the learning and well-being of, of students putting them at the center and defining with such clarity what we want for our children. Now, of course, the vision for education is one thing and making it a reality, a palpable, observable reality in the everyday life of our children in schools, in classrooms, etc., is a different story. But I believe Scotland has several of the pieces, several conditions in place that would be the envy of many other systems and countries around the world. First, you have a very clear vision as to what we as society and as an education system want for our children. And it's one that's consistent with human rights and with what we want education to be. I think everybody wants education to be for their children. And that's not to be taken for granted because there are not many nations that are so clear and crisp on defining what we want for our children and, and that have that shared purpose that can fuel tremendous improvement and change across the system. <laughs> then you have lots of reports. I don't think uh, there's a country with more reports right now diagnosing, you know, with a, diagno uh, with a very good diagnosis of where the system is at right now, what are the major pain points, and what are some of the possible remedies. Uh, we could almost say that Scotland is overdiagnosed right now with where the system is at. And that can be used to our advantage, to your advantage, because you have a good sense well-grounded sense of where the system is at, what are the pain points, and actually what could be done to address those, those pain points. One more thing that I have seen, I have witnessed in um, Scottish ed education is the tremendous public support and commitment and pride in education. And again, that's not something to be taken for granted. It's not something to be taken lightly. There are not many nations where education is such such so valued by society. That's a very important thing. And then I've, I have had an opportunity to interact, to exchange ideas to, uh, with um, leaders and educators uh, at all levels of the system, at the classroom level, at the school level, at the local authority level, at the national level. And I see tremendous goodwill, communication, coordination, 
uh, and, uh, an uh, and good intention to move things forward for education, for education in the country. That's, again, not something to be taken for granted. So you have many of the conditions that would be the envy of any country that wanted to uh, make possible an ambitious reform agenda. Many of those conditions. And I'm very excited to uh, figure out some ways in which we can support your work so that this phenomenal vision you have for students become a palpable, unquestionable reality in the everyday lives of children, young people, and adults working in schools. Now, this sounds very good, you know, I'm, I'm guessing, right? Uh, so, yeah, this, uh, you know, this is a simple list of four major purposes. Uh, they make sense, uh, they may resonate, or they may be very similar to what you believe the purposes of education should be. But here's the, one of the major challenges we'll have to, to tackle. Conventional schooling, massive, compulsory schooling as we know it, is a very imperfect technology to achieve any of these purposes. In many ways, indeed, it gets in the way. And that is so because historically, what we have learned in school, it's almost a universal experience for those of us who have gone to school, what we learn is to be taught. We learn to be taught. What does that mean? We learn to sit quietly, to listen to the teacher, to hear, to, to understand what the teacher is expecting from us and doing it. In essence, when we learn to be taught, we learn to, to do as we're told. We learn compliance. And don't get me wrong, of course it's important to learn compliance. I have two young children, and if they didn't listen to what I'm saying, they didn't do what I'm asking them to do most of the time at least, I would be a mess, and the house would be a disaster. So, of course, it is important to learn to be taught. The problem is when that becomes the consistent, systematic, repeated experience of most of our children and youth when they're in classrooms and schools. Because learning to be taught and learning to learn are very different things. Learning to be taught implies and requires that you put outside of yourself, you place the responsibility to determine what's true, what's good, what's beautiful, outside of yourself. You place that responsibility on your authority, on your teacher, on your head teacher, on your director of education, on your minister of education, etc. You put that responsibility outside of yourself. Learning to learn, on the other hand, requires that you assume responsibility, that you take the responsibility to define by yourself, to determine by yourself, based on your knowledge and experience and expertise and values and culture and uh, intuition, what is true and what is not true, what is beautiful and what's not beautiful, what's good and what's not good. That's at the core of knowing yourself, the first purpose that I was suggesting here. So learning to learn requires that. So if, if most of what we're doing is helping our uh, students be learning to be taught, we're depriving them of the opportunity to assume the responsibility to define by themselves what's true, what's good, what's beautiful. If I had to say it with one simple idea, and, uh, this is, and if there is one idea I want to leave with you, with this keynote, it would be this. Learning is a practice of freedom. Learning is a practice of freedom. When we think about the things we know how to do very well, and that we're proud because we know how to do them very well, and when we think about how we learn them, I think what we realize is that we learned in an environment of freedom, where we had a, 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 a freedom to choose what to learn, how, with whom, for how, for how long, etc. We had autonomy. We had freedom. Learning is a practice of freedom as well because it requires that we feel safe, to try things out, to fall, to fail, and to get back up and try again. And that requires freedom. And children, not necessarily in school, but outside of school, are excellent at doing that. They go for what they want to learn, they fall, they, 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 they get back, they fall again, they get back again, because they feel free. And that's what, that's what gives you the safety to try and do things differently. And that's what learning is about. It's about failing and starting again, and falling again and starting again. 
it, that's failure is a fundamental aspect of learning, and yet one of the first things we learn in school is fear of failure, fear of making mistakes. Uh, and we need to change that. So learning is a practice of freedom, but as a practice of freedom, it is pretty much absent in most classrooms and most schools around the world. And that's not so because of any ill intention of anybody. It is a result of a culture, the default culture of schooling, that has taken shape for over, over, over a century. Um, and it is a culture that has responded to uh, an institution that has been created with purposes that are different than making possible learning as a practice of freedom. Schooling, compulsory massive schooling, um, has historically fulfilled three fundamental functions, important functions. The first one is custody. Schooling is the place where adults send children uh, to be taken care of while they are working, while they go to work. And uh, I think nobody now will question how important that role is for schools. We had a pandemic a few years ago. And we went crazy when we didn't have, those of us who have children, when we didn't have a place to send our children. What a fundamental, what an important role of schools. Custody, that's, what, that's the first historical function of it. But the second, one, the second and third functions of schooling are more questionable, now especially. The second function of schooling is control. Schooling has become a, 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 a vehicle for social control. And finally, sorting. Schooling has become uh, the institu one important institution that uh, evaluates our students, sometimes based on very uh, arbitrary criteria, and uses the results to determine who will have access to what kind of opportunities. That's what schooling is designed to do, and that's what schooling does well. Custody, control, sorting. The problem comes to the surface, I think, when we realize that learning is a practice, if we agree that learning is a practice of freedom, but at the same time we realize that schooling is a vehicle of control, then we have a tension. And that's the core tension we need to work with. Okay? It's not about disappearing schooling, but there's a tension there that we need to tackle, that we need to deal with, especially if we want to keep learning as a practice of freedom uh, alive. And I will argue that learning uh, the, the power of our young people to learn is one of the fundamental ingredients of the human spirit that we need to keep alive. So this is the challenge ahead. Learning is a practice of freedom. Schooling is a vehicle of control. That's the tension we need to learn how to navigate. And, you know, the, the coming back to the, the two trends that I was presenting um, uh, at the beginning, learning to be taught, the world of schooling, has done much more to foster relationships of domination and control. Whereas learning, the spaces where learning thrives, are spaces of solidarity and freedom. So here's our choice. Where are we putting most of our effort? Now, it's important, I think, to, to take a moment to define what do we mean by learning. This is a question that Seymour Saracen, 25 years ago, um, um, asked because what he realized is phenomenal thinker of educational change um, was that learning was something that all of us were talking about in education, but that when you asked people what, what does that mean, we got very disparate answers, not, not a really good agreement on what learning actually means. Uh, and we have the fortune now of having a lot of progress on the neuroscience of learning that can help us get a better, clearer, um, better and clearer sense of what learning actually is. Richard Elmore, a very dear uh, mentor and teacher of mine, a very dear friend as well, um, uh, in his last paper, the last paper he wrote before he passed away very suddenly a couple of years ago, uh, offers one of the most powerful definitions of, of learning that I have come across, and I wanted to offer it to you right now. He says, and this is based on what he learned about the neuroscience of learning, learning is the ability to consciously modify what we know, what we believe, and what we do in response to evidence, experience, and reflection. What a beautiful, I think, and elegant definition. That's what learning is. The ability to consciously modify what we know, what we believe, what we do, in response to evidence, experience, and reflection. 
This is what the neuroscience of learning would tell us learning is. And I think this is a fabulous starting point, I think, and I would have loved to have an opportunity to sit with Richard again to talk about the ways in which I believe the, this definition, which is a phenomenal progress with regards to defining learning, uh, could be refined or the things that we should be paying, other things we need to pay attention to. And for that, I would bring to the table, when if I were in the, at the table with him, as, as we did many times over dinner, uh, I would present uh, the definition of learning that I, uh, that I uh, propose in, in my book, Liberating Learning. And I, uh, I define learning as the process and the result of making sense of questions that matter to us. And there are two fundamental elements that I wanted to highlight here. First, learning is both process and result. So that was the first thing to, to mention. But the second one is, it's not, um, uh, uh, Elmore's definition in many ways uh, highlights the rational aspect of things. What happens is uh, in our brains as we're making sense of, you know, as we're building new understandings. But at the core of that process is making sense. Making sense, sense making, creating meaning is what propels us to start to create new neural pathways, et cetera, and to modify understandings, beliefs, experience, uh, uh, actions. And so, so I, 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 thought, I think that the, process, the, the definition of learning has to be explicit about it being the, the process that you follow when you're trying to make sense of something. And then I included the, 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 the part of the questions that matter to us. Because one thing that the science is making clearer and clearer is that uh, learning is not only a rational process, it's not only a mental process, it's also an emotional process. It involves the heart, the emotions. That's when we actually learn the best, when we have heightened emotions. They can be bad, negative emotions, and that's what trauma is about. We learn things very profoundly when we experience trauma, uh, but also when we experience joy. Uh, so learning is also an emotional phenomenon, not just a rational phenomenon. And that's what I wanted to capture when I was saying questions that matter to us. So if we were to combine the two definitions, we could say and we could agree that learning is the process and the result of making sense of questions that matter to us by intentionally modifying what we know, what we believe, what we do in response to evidence, experience, and reflection. I think that's a good working uh, starting point. Now, here's the thing. Most of what we're doing in most classrooms and, and schools around the world is not cultivating this kind of learning. The, the, the default definition of learning, what most of conventional classroom and conventional school practices are cultivating, is a different kind of learning. And it's a kind of learning that could be defined as the ability to recall and repeat information and algorithms in a precise and accurate manner. That's the version of learning that we see happening in most classrooms and schools around the world. And that's always been a problem, I think. Many critics of, of schooling have said it since the emergence of schooling. But it's becoming a critical thing right now at this point because the ability to recall and repeat informational algorithms in a precise and accurate manner, an appropriate manner, is something that machines and artificial intelligence now do much better than us, much faster, much more effectively, much more reliably. So if what we continue to do in our schools is to prepare our children to recall and repeat information and algorithms, what we're doing is to set them up for a competition that they're set out to lose. This is something that machines now do much better than us. And in this context, we need to start to think, so what, it is, what is it that humans do much better than machines and that actually bring value to the world? And it's not recalling and repeating information on algorithms. We were fully beaten down now by, by technology, fully. It, there's no way to compete against the power of artificial intelligence when it comes to recalling and repeating information on algorithms. So what makes us human and what can we contribute as humans, as value to the world? I believe there are two things. Well, the first one is the ability for discernment, our ability to judge, to determine what's true, what's good, what's beautiful. That's something that machines by themselves cannot do. Discern what's true, what's good, what's beautiful. That's discernment, our capacity to decide individually and collectively on these fundamental three questions. What is true, what's good, what's beautiful. 
The second one is our capacity of compassion, our capacity to feel what others feel, to, uh, to be in somebody, uh, to place ourselves in somebody else's shoes. That's the other very important aspect of, of, of our, the human spirit that we can bring to life. And I do believe that these two notions of um, uh, compassion and discernment are very well captured in the four capacities uh, that, that are uh, embedded in the, in the curriculum for everyone, uh, for the excellence, sorry, curriculum for excellence. So here's a question I want to pose to you. And if you think about it, then one version of learning is the version for learning to be taught, and it's domination and control. The other version of learning is the one that can help us build more solidarity, freedom, etc. And the question I want to leave for you is to which version of learning will you dedicate your time and effort? Uh, and again, I think that this is a very important question to ask ourselves. Okay? Now, it's important to think about how we learn, what, what learning is, but also I think it's important to ask ourselves how do we learn best? And for that, I want to do a little exercise with you. So we'll have a little interaction over the screens right now, and I'll ask you to have the chat open, because I'll ask you some, um, uh, some, some quick questions in a moment. But first, um, before doing that, try to think of something you're very good at. It can be anything. It can be uh, cooking, or it can be dancing, or playing an instrument, or telling jokes, or doing carpentry, or knitting, uh, or um, uh, making friends. Think about one thing you're really good at. It can be a sport. It can be playing a musical instrument. But think about one thing that, that you're really, really good at. And think of for a moment, how did you learn it? How did you learn that thing that you're really good at? How did you get better at it? And what supports and conditions were helpful? OK? Think about the, one of those things. How, what are you very good at? How do you learn it? How do you get better at it? And what supports or conditions were helpful? Okay, so I'll ask you to take like 15, 15 seconds just to write down your notes. What are you really good at? How do you learn it? How do you get better at it? What supports or conditions were helpful? Okay, so just jot down a couple notes. We have, it's been like 10 seconds, so let's take five more. And then I will ask you to do the following. If you're ready, you know, if you want to share in the chat some of the things you're really good at, how you learned them, please do so. Uh, we would love to hear some of, your, some of your thinking, some of your experiences, how you learn what you're really good at. And here's the exercise I want to do with you. I want to ask you to write a, a Y, a letter Y for yes, or an N for no, if the things that I'm going to mention right now apply to your experience of learning something really well. Okay? So just a Y for yes and N for no in the chat. So let us know, for example, if to learn the thing that you're very good at, or let me put it another way. Tell us yes or no to the question, to the following question. Was this something, was this thing that you're really good at, something that you wanted to learn, something that you were interested in learning? And let us know with your yeses and your noes if this was part of what you of your experience. And I think we have an overwhelming tsunami of, of yeses, right? Maybe, okay, wonderful. So interest, that's a fundamental condition for learning. We learn what we want to learn. Seymour Saracen said it many times ago, many years ago. Uh, and I think we all know that that's, that's the common experience. We learn well what we're interested in learning. Now, I'll ask you to tell us yes or no to the following question. Let, let, let us know if to learn what you're very good at, it was helpful to have exposure to the expert practice you wanted to learn. That means um, if you wanted to learn how to cook, to be, to be able to see a good cook cooking, or to learn a sport, to see a good, a good player playing the sport, or to learn to play an instrument, to see a good player, a good musicians playing the instrument. So if exposure to the expert practice that you wanted to learn let us know if that was part of, uh, of what helped you learn it. Exposure to the expert practice you wanted to learn. Yeses or noes, let us know. Um, and I would guess that for most of you that was the case, having exposure to someone who knew how to do that thing that you know how to do very well, right? Third one, tell us yes or no to the following question. Was it important for you and helpful for you to learn this thing to practice? to do things over and over and over again. Let us know with yeses or noes in the chat again. Was practice an important component of your experience of learning something well? And I suspect we have many yeses right now. Right, super. 
Now, tell us yes or no, and I'll combine two right now. But I can almost guarantee, I can almost bet that it was helpful for you and important for you when you were learning to do the things you're learning, you know how to do very well, to have feedback, information that allows you to see the results of your initial efforts and time to reflect on it. What, what am I doing well already? What do I already know well? What, what didn't work very well? What can I do differently, etc. So tell us yes or no to whether feedback and reflection were also part of your experience of learning something very well. And I see some nodding, face, some nodding heads here. It seems like we have lots of yeses. Wonderful. And finally, raise your, or let us tell us yes or no to whether it was helpful to you to get help from others or to learn alongside others that thing that you were learning. So tell us with yeses and noes if that's been your experience as well. We usually have a more mixed bag when, with this one in particular, but it's usually still more yeses than noes, and I think that's what we're seeing in the, in the chat right now. Wonderful. Okay, so that's it. We have six conditions for powerful learning. They're not only uh, coming from our own experience, they're consistent with what the science of learning is telling us about what are the conditions under which we learn best. Oh, and I forget to ask one more question, and please tell us yes or no to the following question. Was this thing that you know how to do very well something that you learned in a conventional classroom? Let us know. Yes or no? Was it? And uh, I don't know if you see a different trend here. I don't know if you see a different trend here. But in case you don't, we had a tsunami of yeses when I was asking these six questions and a tsunami of noes. When I, when I ask if you learn this in a conventional classroom. And I think this is a good illustration of a core contradiction that we're experiencing right now in our schooling systems around the world. On the one hand is what we believe and what we know about powerful learning. When we think about the things we know how to do very well and how we learn them, what comes to the surface is what we believe and what we know about powerful learning. And this, by the way, is consistent with what the neuroscience of learning is telling us about what learning is and how it happens. But that's what we have on the one hand, what we know and what we believe about powerful learning. On the other hand, we have what we do in schools. And those two things tend to be very different. And I think this exercise is a good illustration of that. Now, what to do, right? So well, this is the tension. This is, what, uh, this, is what, um, um, this is the core tension we need to tackle. This is crucial a crucial tension to tackle if we want to keep the spirit, the human spirit alive. And the good news is that liberating learning, making learning a practice of freedom and ensuring that it becomes a practice of freedom in, uh, in our classrooms and schools and systems is within our reach. Because within our reach is the fundamental unit where the energy resides to make it possible. And that unit is the pedagogical core. Some people have called it the instructional core. I prefer the term pedagogical because instruction already establishes a top-down relationship between the teacher and the student. And the pedagogy is not always that. It, can be, it allows for different arrangements. But anyways, the pedagogical core, that's the fundamental unit that we need to change. And the pedagogical core is fundamentally the relationship between an educator and a learner in the presence of an object of knowledge. That's what the pedagogical core is. Okay, and many, um, many authors, Richard Elmore amongst them, uh, for over a decade have argued that we need to change what happens here in the pedagogical core because at the end of the day, this is where learning happens or not. I mean, we can change many things in an education, in a school and education system. We can create a new curriculum. We can bring new technologies into the classroom. We can um, create new standards and evaluate teachers and evaluate schools and head teachers and bring, you know, uh, repair the buildings. We can do lots of things in schools. But if we don't change what's happening here in the pedagogical core, learning does not improve. So this is a fundamental unit. This is the key arena for learning. If we change everything around it but don't change what's happening in the pedagogical core, learning doesn't improve. Okay. So it's a key arena for learning, and, and that would be enough reason to say, yes, that's where our efforts have to be. But what I have been arguing in the past few years is that the pedagogical core is not only the key arena for learning, it is also the key arena for well-being. 
the, com the dominant, the, the conventional configuration of the pedagogical core is one of domination and control. Content over teacher, teacher over student. That's how it's set up. That's, that's what the culture of schooling has, has, has shaped practi teaching practice into. It's a relationship of domination and control. And now we know, now we have enough evidence to show that that's not where we learn the best, especially good, powerful learning. Again, we can learn through trauma, but that's not what we want, right? We want to learn through joy. And good, powerful learning uh, does not happen in relationships of domination and control. Good, powerful learning occurs in relationships of dialogue, of care of love, of mutual learning, relationships where both parts are learning and changing in, the, in their exchange. That's what learning is about. That's what, that's what a good, powerful pedagogy is about. It's one of dialogue, where both parts learn and change. That has implications not only for learning, but also for well-being. Because if our students are subject com continuously to a relationship of domination and control, where they're always in disadvantage, what that produces, not necessarily with our intention, but in a very effective way, is ill-being. It creates anxiety, creates stress, it cultivates um, uh, depression, the feeling that I'm not important enough, that I'm not, not enough. On the contrary, or in contrast, when children have access to caring adults who listen to them, who learn from them, that are there for them, in solidarity, with love, with compassion. That's where you cultivate well-being. So the pedagogical core is not just the, the, the key arena for learning. It's also the key arena for well-being. Not only that, it's also the key arena for equity. We can say all we want about how important equity is. But if at this level we're not seeing or treating our young uh, brown and black students, our neurodiverse students, our students with uh, um, non-heteronormative -heter gender identities as equals. If we're not seeing them and treating them on equal grounding as complete, full human beings, at this level, the pedagogical core, then equity is not happening. Okay? So the pedagogical core, again, is where learning happens or not, where well-being happens or not, where equity happens or not. And finally, it's also the key arena for democracy. As I think it's evident at this point, in the pedagogical core, we have relationships of power. And in its conventional configuration, the, ped the pedagogical core is a set of relationships of domination and control. And again, what we cultivate, when that's the kind of relationship we subject our children to, what we cultivate, again, not intentionally necessarily, but very effectively, is the mindsets, the attitudes, the beliefs that are required to sustain authoritarian regimes, dictatorships. On the contrary, democracies are the places and the spaces, the systems where, or the status where, the relationship between the state and the citizen, or in a small scale between the teacher and the student, is a relationship of dialogue, of mutual learning, of mutual influence, where one part influences the other. That's what healthy democracies, that's what robust democracies are about. So here's a fundamental unit we need to change. Um, it, the good news is that we're, if we're able to change what happens here in the pedagogical core, we are nurturing and we are uh, creating or developing four of the fundamental ingredients of a better world, aren't we? Learning, well-being, equity, democracy. And uh, let me say one more thing. The pedagogical core is also like the nucleus of an atom. Within it, there is tremendous energy. Tremendous energy that's waiting to be released. I've seen it over and over again, especially in some beautiful examples of uh, pedagogical renewal in the global south. But once you change what's happening in the pedagogical core so that young people rediscover their power to learn, Nothing can stop them. Even if you try, you won't be able to stop them. Once teachers start to witness the power of the students to learn by themselves and to help others learn, 
there's nothing that will stop them. And even more beautiful, almost a human inclination when you have this beautiful experience of rediscovering your power to learn is that you will want others to have a similar experience. So you'll do everything you can to expand this, to spread this experience to others, to make it possible for others as well. Now, changing the pedagogy, so that's the good news. The, the, the fundamental unit that we need to change is within everybody's reach. The difficulty and the challenge is that it has proved to be, it has proven to be very difficult to change. Uh, the pedagogical core has remained practically stable for over 150 years. Uh, and changing what's happening here will require deep and widespread pedagogical changes, as Jill was, uh, was referencing some of, some of the thinking uh, in my recent book. We will need deep and widespread cultural change. Now, another good news is that as humanity, we already have a mechanism to change culture in a deep and, power and, and widespread manner. And that mechanism are social movements. Social movements are, have historically been forces of collect, collective forces of uh, cultural renewal, beyond other things. But that's where I focus my attention when I think about educational change. Social movements have, are, are the vehicle that humanity has designed, has developed, to change culture in a profound way and in a widespread manner. So one of the invitations that, uh, that, I, that I propose or one of the invitations I present in my, in my book, Liberating Learning, is to start thinking about and practicing educational change and social movement. At the end of the day, what we need is cultural change and social movement is the vehicle by which cultural change can be achieved. So we need to start thinking about the role not as implementing a particular policy or developing a particular material, but it's not a technical solution. But it is about triggering, sustaining, spreading a widespread movement of pedagogical renewal with the focus on changing what's happening at the pedagogical core, of course, to make, to, to make, it, uh, to make these four core capacities of the curriculum for excellence a reality in the everyday life of our students, in the everyday life of our students in classrooms and schools. So the idea of educational change as a social movement is, um, is, uh, stands in contrast with the dominant paradigm that has guided the way we have understood and we have practiced and, and attempted education reform all over the world, which is the paradigm of scientific management. This paradigm that emerged and was influenced by the, uh, the, uh, the Industrial Revolution. And that propose with, you know, um, uh, where, uh, that this a paradigm that proposed that to organize, the best way to organize human activity, and remember this is in the time of the invention of the factories, the mass production, that the best way to organize human activity was to break it down into small chunks, into easy, repetitive, uh, monotonous tasks, and to create a system of external incentives for, uh, to secure adequate execution. That's what scientific management is. It's, it, it's, that's, that's been the dominant paradigm shaping still up to this day how many of our institutions are run, how many of our organizations are uh, organized, designed, etc. And when I talk about thinking about and promoting educational change as a social movement, I'm trying to propose an alternative paradigm, another way to think about and practice the work we do as leaders, as educators, so that it can override the dominant paradigm of uh, scientific management. And in this table, you will see the contrast that I offer between the two, uh, the two paradigms. Leadership in scientific management is hierarchical, whether, whereas in social movements it is networked, distributed. The core values of scientific management are the achievement, speak, efficiency, Ian, the speakers are mute. Speak, speak Did I, can you hear me now? Awesome. <laughs> awesome. Thank you for letting us know. Sorry, this, this little, little, little moment of silence. Uh, the core values in scientific management are achievement, efficiency, control, whereas in social movements the core values are learning efficacy, democracy. The core practices of scientific management are prescription, mandates, external accountability, whereas in social movements you have dialogue, deliberation, internal accountability. Scientific management relies on in external incentives and resources. Social movements rely on intrinsic motivation and resourcefulness. 
Uh, the stance on change on scientific management is incre incrementalism. Change little by little and as little as possible. Stability. Social movements are forces of radical innovation and cultural renewal. And if you look at the overarching body of research that's showing us what's effective when it comes to leading change, I think you will see everything on the right side. Right? So the idea of the social movement is really not that much of a new thing as, mu as much as it is just an attempt to organize, to bring together in a somewhat coherent way what we already know about powerful change and how it happens. The powerful leadership, effective leadership. So this is a new paradigm, I think, I would like to propose. And again, one is a paradigm of domination and control. The other is a paradigm of solidarity and freedom. Marshall Gans is another phenomenal thinker, a, a very dear mentor of mine, who studies and has participated in several social movements. And he, he offers a definition of leadership that I find incredibly illuminating. He uh, proposes that leadership is accepting responsibility to enable others to achieve shared purpose under conditions of uncertainty. Leadership is actually, emer it actually emerges not when everything is certain and we know and everything is calm. At that point, we don't need leaders, right? When we need the leaders is when times are uncertain, when we don't know what to do. So that's when leadership emerges. But when uncertainty emerges, when uncertainty emerges, emerges sorry, leaders are not only those who help navigate the uncertainty, but also help galvanize a shared purpose, a common purpose, something that means that's meaningful for all of us for the collective, for the group, so that we can work together to accomplish it. That's the work of the leader, forging unity of purpose in times of uncertainty. That's our role. And notice that in this definition, leadership, there's nothing that speaks to the particular role, formal role that someone has in an organization or, a, or, an, or an institution. It's just someone who accepts the responsibility to enable others to achieve shared purpose under conditions of uncertainty. It's, it's, it's a personal decision, and anybody can be a leader. I saw this morning, I visited uh, a high school in the west, uh, west side of, uh, the west end of Glasgow, and saw this amazing group of young, young students in uh, S5, uh, S6 who started uh, somewhat like some, uh, a comedy one, one of them, one, of, one comedy was on uh, anti-racism. And they studied the topic and they are training their teachers on anti-racism. Uh, and now they're, today or tomorrow they were meeting with the curriculum uh, people at the, at, the, at the school to see how to start permeating the everyday teaching with anti-racism. That's, that's it, that's, that's leadership. <laughs> Those are students. And they're portraying a beautiful an example of leadership. There was another group working on equity, another group working on gender and sex identity, and they have now been developing training for their teachers and for teachers in other schools. That's leadership. They're helping others shared purpose, uh, achieve shared purpose under conditions of uncertainty. And, uh, and that's a beautiful thing to see. And of course, they're finding some resistance on the part of some teachers, and probably the teachers that need it the most, that need this training the most. And what I shared with these young people is, don't take it personal. It may be that what you're doing is to reveal some of our greatest fears as adults. And, uh, and equity, racism, uh, gender identity are things that we as adults didn't grow up knowing much about. So we can feel very uncomfortable trying to understand how, we, how to navigate relationships permeated by race, by gender identity, by, um, uh, by neural diversity, etc. Anyways, that was leadership. Leadership does not depend on your formal role, but on whether or not you accept the responsibility to help others achieve shared purpose under conditions of uncertainty. And leadership at the end of the day, and this is something that Marshall Gans would propose as well, is about mobilizing three aspects of the people you work with. It's about mobilizing hearts, heads, and hands. And I'll just walk very briefly through this, but the heart is the work of forging unity of purpose, mobilizing emotions. 
emotion is the trigger for action. That's, that's scientifically demonstrated. What moves us, our emotions, to, what propels us to act, our emotions, not thinking, emotions. And we need to forge that, forge unity of purpose. The, Place of the head is the continuous learning. We need to learn continuously about what's working, what isn't, etc. And the hands, it's a, the realm of action, developing capacity to do things differently, developing capacity to collaborate effectively. And we're in times where uh, we need to start seeing ourselves as part of a larger system and act as part of a larger system so that our role is not only working with our school but with other schools and not as part of the, uh, the single school, but as part of a system. That's the idea, to start to become a system leader, someone who sees themselves and, 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 and act as, as part of a larger system, not only to use the resources that the system offers, but also to influence the system as a whole. And for that, this uh, concept of Andy Hargraves, that Andy Hargraves um, coined of leading from the middle, of leadership from the middle, I think is very illuminating and very helpful. So our role, regardless of where we are in the institution, in the system, our role is to exert influence in three directions. Downward, what we have to do is to liberate and support those we lead. Liberate them and support them so the, so the best of their creative genius can come to the surface and can help solve some of the most wicked challenges that are being faced with our students in our schools. And supporting, because it's also about building capacity. And sometimes about getting things out of the way, right? Changing what, what we as a system are asking schools to do that may be getting in the way of, of what teachers know has to happen with students. Laterally, what you do is to collaborate and connect. To connect with your peers, with other head teachers, with other uh, directors of education, depend, regardless of what, with other teachers, if you're a teacher. Connect and collaborate laterally. It can be to help others solve problems that you know how to solve. It can be to get help from others to solve problems that you don't know how to solve, but they do. Or it can be about facing similar and finding, finding solutions to problems that you both share, but that none of you knows how to solve. Those are the three fundamental ways in which you can start connecting and collaborating laterally. And finally, leveraging and influencing upward. Let me say a couple of things around this. First, your role, regardless of where you are, your role is not to implement policy from above. Your role is to leverage it. And it's a slight change of words, but I think it's a very important difference. You're not, there to, you're not here to do what the boss is telling you to do. You're here to understand what the policy, the resource is, and see whether or not it's helpful to your agenda to liberate learning, and then leverage it. Use it as a lever, as, as a lever to advance your local agenda. And then your role is, again, to find ways in which you can influence the larger system. It can be in advisory groups, or in, you know, in networks, or find ways to find allies in the system that can support the work you're trying to promote, etc., so that you can start influencing the larger system. It's not going to be through the top that the powerful learning that needs to happen in schools will, will trickle down. It is going to be through the middle and through the bottom. Of course, the top can do very important things to support the change, but the force for it will come from below and from the middle of the system. And I have seen a remarkable amount of energy, commitment, talent, intelligence, all across the system here in this beautiful country of yours that I think we need to tap into and coordinate so that we can create a coherent effort to liberate learning across the entire, the, entire, the entire nation. I have talked about the human spirit and how important it is channeling again uh, Margaret Whitley to create islands of sanity. And I think as a country, Scotland has the conditions on the table right now. They have the conditions in place to become an island of sanity at the national level. And this has important not, not only for Scotland, but for the, for the world and for the future of the human spirit. So let's do it. The power to learn is like a flame. It's like this flame we have here. It's a very weak flame. The power to learn of our children and our young people, something that a, a, a blessing that they're born with, that they're physiologically designed for, their power to learn is a flame. And it's very weak right now because it's times of huge hurricanes and storms and wind. 
So the role of our schools, I believe, in this context, is to become sanctuaries that protect this flame, that feed it, that help it grow, that help it disseminate to many other places. I think that's the nature of the work we have ahead. And uh, let me be clear, I don't think it's going to be easy. Because educational systems, and I will offer it as a, a, almost as a joke, but I think it's an important contradiction, an important tension that we need to highlight. We're trying to keep this flame alive with a machinery, the schooling system, the compulsory educational system, that's not designed to build fires. It's better designed to throw water and, 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 and blow wind. And that's the core tension we need to deal with. Because even with the best intentions, we have a system, a machinery that's not designed to feed the fires. So we need to figure out, and this is going to be the titanic challenge ahead, how do we repurpose the entire way in which the system works so that it feeds the flames, it keeps them alive. I'm not sure if we're going to succeed with this. But I don't think the reason we do this is because we think we will win, but because it's the right thing to do. Thank you very much for bearing with me. And I just wanted to say one brief thing quickly. Uh, we negotiated a lower price for, our, for the books in this series, the Leading Change series, where Liberating Learning has been published. And for this week, we really negotiated hard with them to offer uh, uh, the, the, the highest discount they have ever offered on their books, which is 25% discount. Um, and uh, so what we want to invite you to do, you will see the QR code right here. Uh, uh, it's only for this week, so the offer ends on September 30th. But I would love to hear your thoughts on liberating learning. It's a good opportunity. It's probably the, the highest discount will be ever, ever, ever uh, available. So uh, grab your copy. I would love to hear some of your thoughts and reactions around it. Uh, you have my email right there, my Twitter account, my email, uh, my, my website as well. I would love to hear from you. Uh, thank you so much for your, for your time, your attention. I look forward to hearing some of your questions. Wow, Santiago, thank you so much. When I did my introduction earlier, I said, sitting right beside me, I had no idea what a privilege it would be to sit beside you and, and to listen to you. And I could see some of the reflections coming through on the chat. And I think that's shared by lots of colleagues this afternoon. Wonderful. Wonderful. We have offered people the opportunity to ask some right. questions. While right. people are having a think about that, I thought I would just give you some of very quick reflections for right, me, please, if, if please that's do, okay. Right. Yeah, that's um, great. You started off by saying that it feels coming to Scotland like you're meeting old friends. And actually, by the end of that, I felt exactly like, like that too. I, I think you were talking to a whole group of people mm. who, were, uh, who could recognise the challenges that, that you shared with us. I did worry when you said you were going to start in a dark place. I worried where you were going to take us. <laughs> but I loved that you got us really quickly to be thinking about hope, but not only hope, what our collective responsibility is as a larger system. And I think that's something for, for all of us on, on the call this afternoon to be thinking about. I think you gave us some really big challenges. Um, it's good to hear your really positive reflections about where we are in Scotland. But you made me think when you talked about the tension between learning being a practice of freedom and actually how often learning feels. And I could see in the chat at the same time a whole host of reflections who were, who were sharing that, that similar thought. And then when you talked about a tremendous energy that's waiting to be released, someone has written in the chat around, actually, it needs a leap of faith. Right. Um, and I'm just spotting from Margaret Sutherland in the chat a really great Scottish phrase of pure, dead, brilliant thinking and sharing. I think that sums up. We might explain, explain that Scottish, um, Scottishism to you later. But I do wonder in our, our questions around... What will it take for that tremendous energy that's waiting to be released right. to get us to a tipping point? Right. And, and finally, you know, when I, I actually felt quite emotional when you were talking about our young people as flames and about schools having a role as sanctuaries to be protecting those flames and another challenge, because what often we do is we throw water or wind. Or, so actually for us to hold on to that as an analogy as, as we reflect through the next wee while of questions, David Burgess is sitting to my right. You can't see him in, in the, the screen, folks. But David is, is picking up questions from the chat and questions we've received earlier. Um, so you might hear David interjecting. But I'm going to kick us off with right. a first question, yeah. um, which I think sums up a lot that was coming through the chat. 
Um, you talked about hearts, heads and hands right. and about mobilising them. How do you mobilise and change yeah. hearts, heads and hands when many of those in, in education systems here across the world um, are responsible for the kind of scientific management piece you talked right. about, right. that you identify this being at the heart of liberating learning. What right. advice would you give us, right. Santiago? Let me start. It's a beautiful question. Yes. Uh, oh. Wonderful. Uh, so, beautiful questions to start with. Let me start with four ways in which you don't change hearts, heads, and hands. Okay? The first, first the ones we don't, and then three that really do work. Okay? So I'll keep you in suspense a little bit, but I want to be clear that there are many ways that we have attempted for many years and that we know don't work. First, mandates. <laughs> Getting people to do the work because they have to, because you said so, because you're the boss. That can get people into compliance, and you, with enough pressure, especially if you have a formal role as an authority, you can get them to do things even if they don't, people don't agree or don't, don't want to do it. But in the long term, that creates... Uh, that's, that, that creates uh, negative results because people will, um, w reasonable people, most of us, when we're told to do something because we have to, we'll resist it, even if the idea is good. Michael Fullan said it beautifully. If, one, if you want to kill a good idea, make it mandatory. <laughs> uh, so mandates, that doesn't really work, especially when it comes to complex work. Right? You can create mandates for simple stuff, but for, for complex work, and that's the nature of the work we have ahead of us, you cannot just make it happen by mandate. The second way that doesn't work, the second um, tactic that doesn't work, is explanation. Uh, explaining the merits of your change proposal. Or evidence, that's the third one. Bringing to people the, you know, the paper, the latest paper showing the statistically significant effects of certain practices and certain outcomes, that by itself doesn't change behavior. Okay? They can be helpful, but they're not enough. So, no ma not mandates, not explanation, not evidence. And the fourth one, not through encouragement. The messages of uh, enthusiasm of, yeah, let's do it, you can do it, I trust you, you, you go for it. That by itself doesn't change practice and doesn't change behavior. Why is that so? Let's think about this analogy of hard, hard, uh, hard head hands. Leading change is about mobilizing those three things simultaneously. And when you do things through mandate, what you're basically trying to move is people's hands, is action, getting to do things. But usually with a mandate, you don't give an opportunity to make sense of what you're asking them to do or no opportunity to connect with their own purpose. Why do, could this be meaningful to me? So you try to mobilize hands, but you forget about the head and the hands. With explanation and evidence, what you're trying to arti activate is the mind, is the, is the head, right? Is the rational part of, of action. But as we were saying, uh, action is propelled by emotion, not by thought. 90% of what we do is propelled by our emotions, not by, by, by what we're thinking. And, uh, or over 90%. So when you're trying to explain things to others so that they are convinced and, and that, that, that this is the way to go or just share the evidence, you're, you're just appealing to the, to the head, but not to the heart, not to the hands. Usually with the, the explanation, doesn't, you, know, you don't offer or we don't usually offer a good idea of how to actually do it, what to do with it. And encouragement is a very tepid attempt to mobilize the heart, right? To try to bring people into a good place, etc. But again, without engaging head or, or, or hands. So the work has to be simultaneous. And these are the four ways that are proven to be insufficient. Okay? They may help. You, you, it, it is not that, that you don't have to spend some time in, in trying these, these things. But by themselves, they're, uh, they're insufficient. There are three ways that are proven to be incredibly effective in mobilizing hard head hands, and they are very effective because they mobilize the three things um, simultaneously. So let me talk about the first one. It's experiences, creating experiences that allow people to see the benefits of the change. That's one, experiences that pull you towards the change, that make you want it. Let me give you an example. When a teacher 
has an experience and has an opportunity to discover their own power to learn. When they, leave, when they are able to, to be in a setting and with a, in an environment where they finally learn something that they never learned when they were in school, and now they realize that they can learn it, that's an experience that can be powerful. And of course, this, is, this would be an experience that could be consistent with the kind of change we want to propose. Uh, another kind of experience is when uh, teachers from other classrooms see other classrooms where learning has come to life, where students are shining, where, they, they, where, where learning is visible, where their confidence, their joy, their eloquence is very evident. And when you see this happening in children, it's very hard not to want to do something like this. So experiences that pull you towards the change, that's, that's a very powerful way to do it, through creating opportunities to live, to feel, the benefits of the change that you're proposing. Nicolas Machiavello, I said it beautifully in The Prince, this beautiful, one of the first kind of treaties on, on the state. Um, um, and uh, he was saying, what, one of the things he said was, it is much easier to organize against change amongst those who oppose it than to organize for change amongst those who may, 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 uh, may, may support it, that could support it. And that is so because people who oppose change have a very clear sense of what they're set to lose, what they may lose, and that propels them to mobilize against it. And people who could uh, support change usually have a, just a very fuzzy view of what the benefits might be. Uh, so it's harder to take a risk when you don't know clearly that it's actually going to be better for you to take it, right? So when you create experiences like these, experiences, what you're doing is to bring to the present moment the, the benefit of doing things differently. Uh, and, and that's why this is a very potent way to mobilize hearts, heads, heads and hands. Now, there's another way, another kind of experiences that you can help cultivate, and, and that's, that's one where you have to be way more sensitive, but it's creating experiences that make the status quo intolerable. Okay? And let me give you an example. I was in Chile a few months ago, and I learned about a school that uh, in, in the indigenous region of Chile, um, and uh, it was a school that for two years uh, it was at the bottom of the performance uh, regionally. They were doing very poorly with all the measures of achievement. And uh, for two years, the teachers in this school were very concerned about what was happening, the same with the leaders of the school. I had been trying several things, like visiting classrooms, offering feedback, like lots of things, you know, getting together in communities of practice, etc. And for two years, they saw no changes in the pedagogical core, no matter how much they were trying. So they tried the following thing. What they did was to create a survey with 12 items for all students in all, 12 in all eight grades. And the survey was a simple survey that I was asking them to, to, to select one of three options for their answers to certain statements. The options were never, sometimes, always. And the items said things like, I feel smart when I'm in a classroom, when I'm in the classroom, or uh, the teacher knows or notices where I, when I don't understand something or when I'm struggling with understanding uh, things in one way, the teacher finds other ways to help me understand it. Statements like, like this, 12 of those uh, items. When the results came back for all the school, for all the students in the whole school, the teachers realized that almost 90% of children were saying that they never felt smart when they were in the classroom. 90% of these kids were saying they didn't feel smart when they were in a classroom. And this shook the team to the core because it helped them see in the voice of the students the tremendous gap there was between what they thought they were doing with their children, what they're achieving with them, and what the children were actually achieving. What this survey did was to make this, the results of this survey did, was to make the status quo intolerable. Teachers could no longer tolerate seeing that nine out of their 10 children would say would never feel smart in a classroom. And that's when they decided to go straight to the pedagogical core. What's the nature of the questions we're asking them? 
Are we asking them how, how, how we're doing, how they're doing? Are we checking for understanding? Are we asking for feedback as to what would improve, you know, what would make the experience better? They started to bring in project-based learning to the work. In only six months, this school moved from being at the bottom of the achievement, six months at the bottom of the achievement um, ladder in, uh, um, in math and science and language, to being one of the top performers in the region in only six months. And all it took was a moment where they realized that the status quo was no longer tolerable, that you could not live in peace with yourself knowing that nine of your, nine, nine of your 10 students didn't, didn't feel smart. Now, of course, this has, if, if you decide to go with a strategy of this kind, you have to make sure there's enough trust already within your team, because otherwise it can derail your efforts very quickly, because it can create a lot of defensiveness. It can create a, make a lot of big emotions arise that are not very positive, and that may derail your efforts. So it's very important to be sensitive to your context, to your team, etc., to know if it's a good moment mm -hmm. to bring up an experience that will make the status quo intolerable. But it can be very powerful if, if used right. And the third way to, to mobilize change would be, and I'm realizing I'm taking so long to respond to one question, but another way to, to mobilize hearts, head, and hands, and I learned this from Vivian Robinson, is to learn to examine existing practice. Look at the kind of practice you would like to change and approach it with curiosity, not with judgment. Okay? And your role, once you define what's the kind of practice you want to change, your influence, Instead of trying to impose a change over it, try to study it. What are the values? What are the beliefs that are underlying the, the people's actions or lack of action? Why is it that they're doing this thing and not this other? Why is it that, why is it that they're not doing this thing and this other? And when you start to inquire into the core values, the core beliefs that are underlying the existing practice, first you will get a better sense of where you, what, what is it that's important for your teachers or for your head teachers, etc. But second, you will have a better way to know what the, what the possible entry point can be or what the shift to your strategy has to be so that when the, the concern of the teacher is valid, is defensible, then, then, then you can adapt your strategy so that it can address that concern. Or when it, when it isn't, you can help the per person with the concern notice that it's a, it's, that it's a concern that, that maybe just be in, in their imagination but not real. Anyway, so three ways to mobilize hearts, head, hands simultaneously. Develop, cultivate experiences in your team that pull them towards the change, that help them see, feel what the, what the benefits of the change are. Um, create experiences. If this is, you know, another possibility is create experiences that make the status quo intolerable. And third, uh, examine existing practice with curiosity, not with judgment. Try to understand what are the values, what are the beliefs that are underlying the uh, certain things that people are doing or are not doing that you want to change, and that will give you tremendous insight also as to what you can do. To, to make it different. And the beautiful thing about doing this uh, when you uh, study practice with curiosity is that you at the same time not only get a better, more accurate understanding of what you need to do, but also you also cultivate trust because people will start to feel listened to and their views and their beliefs being valued. And that's, that's priceless. Trust is a very important thing to cultivate. Anyways, that was a very long answer to the question, but thank you. It was a, a fabulous question to start with. And, and a really full answer. I love your use of the, the word curiosity in there. I think that's yeah. really important. But coming back again to the importance of trust yeah. and collective trust through the system, and that's something that you write about a lot too. Yeah. There's a whole number of questions appearing in the chat. Right. I, was trying to keep, I was trying to keep my eye on the chat at the same time. But David, you're doing that too. And there's a theme emerging, I think, around assessment. Yeah. Can, you, can yeah. you pick that up, yeah. please, David? Yeah, yeah. so there's a common theme coming out is attention. For my practitioners, the assessment to mix the chance to pick that up. We talk about the teacher's professional identity is still very tied with positivism, and the teacher is an expert, the learner will be expected to do what they're told. How can they shift that while the external pressures of assessment keep redirecting them 
to the traditional model of learning and teaching with that external pressure of assessment. Right. right. Yeah, yeah, no, that's, that's, that's a, a tough one. one. Uh, let me just put it that way. That's, that's a tough one. one. Now, there, there are, are some, some things that I, that I think uh, that, f for me, sound like very positive signs. Um, Louis uh, Hayward's uh, assessment of the assessment system and, and what they're advancing as possible ways to, to rethink the assessment system. I think it's a very positive development, just starting to think about an assessment system that not only captures kind of content knowledge and those kind of things, but also um, the other kind of skills that children are developing and young people are developing uh, outside of school or in their leadership uh, work in the school, etc. Uh, so to provide a more holistic picture of the learning of the students and these opportunities, the projects of learning, I think it's called or something along those lines, to where they they are to they get to choose a problem or a question that they're going to tackle, and then they are to ma demonstrate their ability to tackle those questions. I think that's really, and I think it's you know, something that's really worth our attention and, and that needs some support. So know that that's that's already at least that's already in the discussion that assessment has been identified, especially standardized testing, the way that the way it runs in a country like in, in Scotland can be very constraining. I was in a high school today that decided to bypass uh, the S4 uh, test, uh, the examination, and that gave them a lot of breathing room to start being more innovative in the work they're doing with their students. So it is a tough one, but here's what I would say. And I will connect it at some point to the leap of faith that one of you were, were talking about. Over and over again, we find that when a school or a system places their focus on the pedagogical core, on creating the conditions and the relationships under which students rediscover and, and unleash their power to learn, they do very quickly start doing well in the test. Okay? So, uh, if there may be a dip in performance, and that's sometimes uh, anxiety producing, but almost invariably what we have seen is that when you get the pedagogical core right, those kind of results will follow. And that's so because at the end of the day, when students are exploring questions that matter to them, they learn content at 10 times the pace, at 10 times the pace, where they're exploring questions that are really relevant to them, they can learn science and math and, and language and all those things in an integrated, coherent way, and in a way that's important to them. And they learn it because they have to learn, they want to learn it, not because they have to. And here I want to bring out a quick reflection about curriculum. We can think about curriculum as something you teach just in case, like you might need it in the future. And that's what a lot of testing preparation is. I mean, how would you do if you were to take a test right now that our students take? I'm pretty sure most adults would fail those tests. So that's one thing to, to, to think about. But um, that's, that's using the curriculum just in case, teaching it just in case. The secret really is to learn how to teach it just in time. You need to know the curriculum very well, but not to determine when you're going to be teaching it, but so that when students are exploring a question that, that intrigues them, that, uh, that, uh, that engages them, that really has them, their, their passion, their hearts, their minds captured, then you can bring it in. You can bring this piece of curriculum in when they need it to tackle the problem they're trying to solve, to go over a difficulty they're having. And what you're doing there is providing the opportunity for them to learn it because they need it, because they want it, not because they have to. And that's the kind of learning that sticks. I think part of the work has to be to start bringing down the legitimacy, legitimacy of examinations. There's a beautiful example, a beautiful uh, experiment that was run in an elite school in um, New England in the United States. What they did was to give students the test, the final test for science. So this is what any elite school would do. But then the experiment was to give them the same test, a simpler version, to the same students three months after. So the experiment was simply seeing how are they doing the first time around and how do they do three months after. It's the same children, it's the same young people, it's the same test, only simpler, only three months after. And of course they didn't tell the students they were going to have a test. The average grade the first time around was B+. Plus. Quite reasonable, so you have some A's, some B-minuses, some C's, but on average you have B+. Plus. 
So help us in the chat and help us guess what the average grade was in this same test, simpler, a simpler version, uh, with the same students only three months after. Give us a sense of what some of those answers might be. What, uh, what, are, what, are, what, what are your guesses? What's the highest, oh, what's the lowest we have seen? Early guesses are C's, C's coming through okay. in the chat. Okay. C minus. C yep. minus, okay, okay, yeah, okay. Well, you're very optimistic. Oh. The average grade was F. That was the average grade, average. That means nobody, no single student could demonstrate the mastery that they had demonstrated three months earlier we can get really good, and I'm an example of that, at passing the tests without really learning. We can learn to ace that game. And students are very smart, and they can learn how to do that without really learning what they're supposed to, what, what they're supposed to have learned in the test. So I think we need to put into question the legitimacy of testing as, as the measure of quality and learning. And we need to start to think about assessment in a, in a way that's more reflective of the actual learning of our students uh, and, and in a, in a more holistic. And I think what this uh, Hayward report offers some really nice uh, ideas, really important ideas. And it's not only kind of wishy-washy ideas. It's based on what other countries are doing, on, on good evidence, on what works, etc. cetera. Uh, now, I'm not advocating here for the end of testing and assessment, but the problem is who do we place on the driving seat? And when we have high stakes accountability systems, the testing, which should be on the copilot seat, becomes the pilot. And that's where very, uh, uh, where things get distorted because the drive is to do well in the test and not to learn better. The driver's seat has been taken by learning and the testing has, can be there but in the co-pilot seat, not in the driving seat. So it's not, a, it's not putting an end to the tests, but uh, re-signifying its use and knowing that if you take this leap of faith and really nail down how to change the pedagogical course so that children rediscover and unleash their power to learn, then they'll be doing well in tests. They will. About leap of faith, I just wanted to say one more thing. There's a, one of my favorite movies is V for Vendetta. And uh, there's this moment where one, a journalist that's, uh, that's an ally, becomes an ally to this uh, uh, underground hero that wants to blow up the British Parliament in uh, the post-apocalyptic uh, Britain. Um, she gets captured and she's sent to a, to a jail, to a cell. And it's a very small cell, painted in white all, all around. And there's a small window in this cell. And every time she looks out the window, she sees a guard standing in the hallway. There, there comes a moment where she has a moment, uh, 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 an experience of awakening, of personal uh, illumination and enlightenment and awakening. And then she decides to go to the door of the cell and to push it. And the door opens. So you, she realizes that the door had never been <laughs> locked. And then she looks out the, the, the door and the guard is there, so she steps back but she sees that nobody comes. So she looks out again, and the guard is still there, so she comes back. And then she finally dares to give her leap of faith to walk into the hallway. And the guard is there, but he's just standing. And then she starts walking down the hallway and finds that the guard is a mannequin. A lot of what's holding us from doing what's, what we have to do is in our minds. A lot of those, pre the prison is, a lot of the prison is here in what we think the limits are. And what I want to invite you to do is to start pushing doors. There's a head teacher that I met recently that's, that's been part of the stretch program that started to do some beautiful work around uh, healthcare and, and uh, creating a, a, a shared um, health data system to, 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 to share with the school system. And one of the things he was telling me is that 
and this is part of the stretch program. So they're supposed to run some inquiry and offer some uh, some ideas, some proposals to the ministry, etc. Uh, and uh, um, what he was saying was, when we prepared our first presentation, we were sure they were going to come to get us and they were going to stop us. But there was no one there to stop us. So then we were able to do the, take the next step. And at the next step, we were sure they were going to come and stop us, and no one came to stop us, so we take it, it took the third step. So I want to invite you to, to push that, that cell door, and I think you will realize that you're in a system where you have a lot of allies uh, that can support your going out of that jail. Uh, uh, and uh, and sometimes testing can become kind of the, the easy, it can become the guard in the hallway that we think is there and if we don't, you know, that it's going to come and get us. But push the door and see what happens. And I suspect you will find way less resistance in the system to what you're doing than you believe you will get. Um, I will leave it there. That's a good point to, to stop. I think we were all hanging in every word around that story, around the guard, the dog and the hall, and actually... If, if we're talking about collective trust, right. there's no dog or no guard. Or, right. And we often, I think in Scottish education, we talk about if they did that bit different or, or if that. And actually, it's a we. So maybe there's a collective pushing of doors right. there right. so that people don't always feel it's an individual right. pushing a door, right. just to continue that right. theme. Right. There's a lot in the chat, Santiago, around learners right. and examples where learners right. have led with their hearts. Uh, you know, are there examples that you can share yeah. around learners um, leading with their hearts, their heads and their hands? There's also reflections around not having to measure everything, but a yeah. question, should we be measuring compassion? So mm -hmm. interesting, um, yeah. there's a lot of reflections yeah. actually, you're making people think. Wonderful. But some examples maybe of young people yeah. who are stepping into that leadership space. Right. And then David, I'll come back to you for maybe a final roundup of any themes that are emerging. So should I, should I, uh, let me offer a quick example, which is from a secondary school I visited in Chile recently. And the reason I want to offer a, an example of secondary school is because I know that secondary school in, in, in Scotland might be the, the, the toughest one to change. Like there's, there's a lot of apprehension around the tests that is well, under, uh, it's understandable. Uh, and a lot of the, the activities every day, the activities are driven by doing well in the test. And again, it's a legitimate concern of teachers to do this. But I know that's where uh, changing the pedagogical form may, may be more challenging. So this was a school that was, became known in the community as the dump, as the dumpster. Because it was a school where all the students that nobody else wanted were sent. Those who were expelled, those who dropped out, were sent to this school. And it was in a point of crisis where... Uh, less than, uh, at some point they had had 3,000 students and they got to the point where they had less than 500 students. It was a very low reputation. And they decided to partner with an organization that's called, um, I'm forgetting his name, the, the name right now. Um, but uh, they partnered with this organization that was bringing project-based learning to their work. That was, that was the fundamental idea, partnering with them to start to develop project-based learning. By the time I visited them, they had a wait list because so many students wanted to go there. And you could see a vibrant place of learning. Let me give you a few, a few examples. I, 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 the first place they took me to is a room that's the community hub, where anybody in the community can come to pose a problem to the, to the students and say, hey, about transit, about safety, about parks, and, and ask the students, can you help me solve it? And the students get together with the teachers and say, can we help solve this? And then, if, and most of the times they say yes, and then design a solution for the problem. A, a, a light, a traffic light in a place where many students cross, for example. The, I, was, I visited, another space that I visited was a fab lab where students were creating a, the prosthesis of a foot. Because a, 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 a man in the community had lost half of his foot and the hospital was offering to see him and to have a prosthesis for him in about four, three to four years. And it was feeling like too much. So he came to the school to say, do you think you could help me build a prosthesis for my foot? So they arrived, they already had a prototype. They had a whiteboard 
were at the center. They had the name of this man, Ruben. And then a mental map where they had organized all the information they had gathered about Ruben. His size, his habits, the kind of things he ate, his allergies, the kind of med medicine and the, the substances that he was allergic to, uh, uh, how old he was. They had a picture of, of Ruben in front of them as they were developing the processes. And they were very close to, to completing it. These are children who were stigmatized as the dumpster children. And when I asked them, you know, is this, is this an important thing for you to do? They said, yes, because I know I'm making a difference in somebody's life. And the whole curriculum is organized around it. So as they're developing the processes, they learn about materials, and they learn about, about, about engineering and mathematics and modeling. They learn about sociology. They learn a lot of things about health, about well-being, about care, about habits. And they learn at 10 times the pace. Um, I think this is a powerful example of what schools can become. Uh, and if, if, if given the opportunity, I think young people are ready to change the world, to improve their communities. They're ready. It's, it's just a matter sometimes of letting go of our reins and let them explore the world and make it a better place. They're ready for it. They're designed for it. They are, this is a generation that's eager to do something to make this world a better place. So let's let them. And, and actually to liberate their learning. Right. right. I think someone wrote a book. Right. <laughs> so I've heard. That sounds familiar, Jill. That sounds familiar. <laughs> David, coming back to you for any other themes that you want, want to capture from the chat. chat. Um, so lots of themes are coming through, resonating with so many, about what you've just described and comments about assessment and about um, learning from early years and early practice. Um, a question came in about um, AI and about what you said it's from uh, Mr Archibald talking about um, avoiding setting up learners against machines. Do you have a vision of what the structure might you just kind of touched on the vision of that from what you've shared, but the vision of, of what the structure of schooling and learning might look like in the future. And I think particularly in Scotland where we currently are, to, to what you've just described. Right. Uh, I, I think, think for students on their views or artificial intelligence are going to fall behind. I mean, we, that's, that's, that's one thing we need to do. The first big contribution of artificial intelligence is that they're helping us more, it's helping us very quickly see now the tremendous contradiction that we are living in schooling, which is uh, the contradiction between learning and compliance. And given that machines are much better at compliance right now, at repeating information algorithms, etc., they're making the, the contradiction now almost intolerable. So I think it forces us, artificial intelligence forces us to ask, ask a question such as, if what we're asking our children is something that machines know how to do better, why do we keep our children asking, to, why, why do we keep asking them to do it? It might be a bit of a waste of time. Again, our focus has to be on what makes them fundamentally human and how they can bring value to the world. Not how to memorize and repeat information on algorithms. No longer. That's, that's what artificial intelligence does now. And I think, again, one first positive development is that it forces us to look more carefully at what we're doing with our children. I wonder how ChatGPT do or how a ChatGPT uh, kind of enabled uh, machine would do with the examinations that our, that our students are currently doing. And I suspect it won't take too long before they excel at this examination. And that's why uh, we need, they did a similar experiment with uh, artificial intelligence with the bar exam for lawyers in the United States. The first time around, artificial intelligence scored around the 30th percentile, so very low in the test. But then with some refinements and with the learning that artificial intelligence kind of is equipped to, to do, very shortly after, the performance of artificial intelligence on the bar exam for lawyers was on the 90th percentile, on the 90th percentile. So I think it's going to be a waste of our time, effort, energy to continue training our children to do things that machines, to do, things that machines do much better. Uh, now, what else? I think we need, need to learn how to navigate and how to use artificial intelligence whenever they help us recover our humanity. Like, so that's, that's a very important thing. The thing with digital in general is that it tends to be more distracting 
that is helpful. Look at how hard we find it. You know, what's the first thing when we wake up? We have our phone next to us, we open it, we scroll down. And it's not to learn, it's not to make ourselves more human. It's because we're addicted to them. We're distracted by them. And I think we need to be, be very careful with that. So the use of uh, technology and artificial intelligence will have to be very strategic. It has to be uses. It has to be uses that allow you to do things that you would not be able to do without them. Connecting with the world, connecting with, uh, with experts all over the world to, to explore questions that matter to you. Uh, making your thinking and your work visible to a much wider audience. I think those are beautiful, powerful ways to, to leverage digital and artificial in, 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 intelligence in general. But we should not put the digital and artificial intelligence as the, as the driver. The driver is, continues to be pedagogy. That's consistent. That's where our focus has to be. If technology can be used to accelerate, to deepen student learning, let's use it. But if it doesn't help us produce any deeper learning that we're producing without it, let's put it aside because it also has side effects that can be very damaging and we need to be very cautious about. And we need to take a leap of faith. That's it. <laughs> but that's where we're at. That's where we're at. I mean, the thing is, it's a leap of faith from and when what's behind us, we already know, yeah. doesn't serve us. So I think we have nothing to lose. We really have nothing to lose. And I think that's a really powerful message for all of us to have heard tonight. I was looking just a, a quick um, look at, it, at the comments in the chat and people are saying what I said earlier on. I think you've really, really inspired. You've provoked us. You've challenged us. And I, in my introduction earlier, I talked about the importance of this being a conversation yeah. and not a keynote. Right. And it felt like a conversation. Oh, it felt like the, the chat and how you engaged with all of that. It's felt like a really, really powerful conversation. Awesome. A conversation that's not going to end, I don't think, yes, when no. people hang up and go and right. head off to spend the rest of their evening. Right. So can I just say again, thank you so, so much, Santiago. It's been an absolute pleasure to have you here today. Thank you very much. Let's make it happen, Scotland. Let's turn Scotland into an island of sanity. Uh, uh, again, this is going to be important not just for Scotland. It's important for the world, for humanity. So let's make it happen. Let's do it. Um, I suspect you're, I'm going to see, be seeing more of you and you're going to be seeing more of me <laughs> in the upcoming months and years. Uh, I, I consider this now uh, a, 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 a very, uh, I consider Scotland a very good friend and I look forward to working with you to liberate learning across the entire system. Thank you very much. Fabulous. Thank you. Thank you. Folks, thank you for, for joining us this evening. I hope you have really enjoyed that. I, I know you have actually from seeing your reflections. It's given me an enormous amount of food for thought and I'm sure for you too. I mentioned at the beginning that over the, the next few days, this conversations programme will be built around virtual keynote presentations by three international globally renowned educators and um, commentators in education. So just really quickly, because I know that I'm all that stands between you and your dinner or whatever your evening plans are, so just a really brief introduction to our two other presenters. Tomorrow, you hear from Pak T, a professor at Singapore's National Institute of Education. Pak T's work focuses on educational leadership, policy and reform, and he's deeply involved in the development of school and teacher leadership. He's no stranger to the international platform. He's spoken at many global events, and you old SLF hands who are familiar with the, the, the Learning Festival will know that this isn't the first time that he's addressed a Scottish audience he was one of our keynotes in 2019, so it'll be an absolute pleasure to welcome him back tomorrow. Um, and then on Thursday, we will be hearing from Alison Skerritt, Professor in the Language and Literacy Studies Programme area at the University of Texas in the United States. Alison is a member of the International Council. She's deeply committed to promoting equity and social justice in education, and she'll present our keynote SLF conversations between 4 and 6 p.m., just like we were tonight on Teams Live. And remember, just like tonight, at the end of each keynote address, our team will help facilitate a live um, Q&A. And if you've got any burning questions, that's your chance to put them forward to continue and to keep the SLF, the SLF conversations flowing. So again, thank you, Santiago. Thank you, colleagues, for your time this evening. And hopefully we'll see you tomorrow and Thursday. Have a lovely evening.